So I won't speak to you very long because we've had, we've had talks from people who are much more distinguished than myself. Uh, but um, uh, I liked how Neely introduced everybody, okay? She said, Professor Oren and Professor Arnon and Professor Shashua. And she said, and Sylvan. And, and, and it, I found that very appropriate because my father was, the, was Mr. Adams, will always be Mr. Adams to me, and I'm uh, happy to be just Sylvan. Uh, anyway, I'm, you know, it's 20 years, this program. We're celebrating 20 years, and really, I have to say, it's gone by like that. Uh, my father passed away at age 100 in uh, 2020. Um, and uh, I'll tell you, it's, actually, I'll tell you a story about, about what happened to him. So he lived 10 years after this, after this uh, little movie was done. And uh, my father loved to eat. Uh, that was his, I think it was his favorite thing. And uh, we, went, we went to Montreal. I, we, uh, my, my, my wife and I had already made a liah. Uh, but we went to Montreal to celebrate my father's 100th birthday. It's quite an achievement. And uh, he was full of life and he, he enjoyed. I, I remember him fi finishing every piece of birthday cake and, you know, he loved to eat. And the next day, he stopped eating. And we were, supposed to, uh, we were supposed to leave a couple of days later to visit our daughter in Vancouver. And uh, my father stopped eating. And I said to my wife, we cannot leave here. This is, some, something is up. My father never spent a day in the hospital. And uh, it's like, anyway, nine days later, he passed away. And it was almost like he waited for us to come because we, for one, one's birthday party, we wouldn't, we wouldn't, we never missed any of his birthday parties. Uh, and it's like he waited for us to, 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 to come and we were able to say goodbye to him. So when I see this movie, it's like, uh, it brings back, it's a bit hokey, the movie, but my father's uh, character, uh, true character really, really does come out. And uh, I'm very, and I'm very proud to be the successor of this brilliant program that my, that, uh, that my father initiated. Um, actually, he did it after my mother passed away. She was already gone. But my father initiated this. He always said he doesn't, he only invests in people. And uh, you fantastic uh, students and alumni um, are a testament, and even Professor Shashua's uh, a student, uh, I, I was very pleased to hear that. Uh, that he's an Adams Fellow, and you, I know you have an uh, alumnus, um, you have a fellowship group, which I think is fantastic. And we are seeing that you are the best and the brightest in Israeli society. We've seen how important uh, you are. We saw it in, with the amazing things that we've witnessed uh, in Lebanon in the last, in the last couple of weeks. Uh, who would have thought this? This is science fiction, but it's based on it's based on uh, the work of people like you, and we, we, you, you are existential to our, not only to our existence, but to the way we will thrive in the future. And I'm, uh, as I said, I'm proud. I will be proud to hand uh, fellowships out. It's a two-year fellowship. Unfortunately, October the seventh interrupted the 2023 uh, uh, meeting, and I'll be very, very proud. I'm always very proud to be able to hand out uh, the the certificates. Uh, and again, we, we, I hope to be able to follow some of your work uh, and, and have some of you back to do a speech like Professor Shashua did today. Thank you. And, uh, okay. And we will start with Michael Bill. Hi. Well, thank you for the lovely musical interlude. Um, so how did I get here? Uh, growing up, you know, Shabbat dinner was a table with six professors, you know, two of them, my mother and father from uh, Ariel and Ben Gurion universities. My grandmother was herself a member of the academia. So it did, didn't really take uh, much convincing. Um, I was so eager, in fact, to start in academia that at 18, I joined the academic reserve program so that I spent four years in academia and then six years in the military. 
this was kind of a um, same as everywhere else, but opposite from Israel because you know coming back home, all of my friends wanted to talk about their military stories when under, I was an undergraduate and vice versa. So after four years and two undergraduate degree, degrees at the Technion, I finally had to choose my job in the military. And you know the common wisdom is take a computer job at Shmone Matayim and you'll be gold. But there was really one question that I really cared about, which was, let's say a young, you know, hypothetically bright officer has some good idea. Will you run with it? Will you be able to try it? And a lot of people said, you know, no, or, um, you know, it doesn't really work like that. We're more of a top down kind of place. And there was one place, the uh, Navy Department for Electronic Warfare, which said, you know, we can't guarantee you'll have any bright ideas, but if you have one, then, you know, we'll try it. So that's where I went. Um, and, you know, they delivered. So it was this kind of place where you have to be a jack of all trades. You have to do experiments and installations and calculations. And that's what I realized I want to do, right? I wanted to do everything. I enjoyed it a lot. And that's what I get to do in Ido Kaminer and Oren Cohen's lab at the Technion. So what's my research about? I researched the interaction between matter and light. So this is something that's all around us. You know, we have light uh, projecting onto matter and into your eyes so you can see me. Uh, we use light matter interactions for everything, right? We have these screens, which are chunks of matter, which we electrify and we get light. X-ray imaging, where we shoot high energy light through a body and see what gets to the other end. And even, you know, LASIK eye surgery, where we use light to sculpt an eye to improve vision. So we actually know a lot about strong light. You know, we know it's different. You keep on increasing brightness and things get brighter until eventually, for instance, something starts to burn. So something else happens. We also know that at a small enough scale, we kind of have to talk about light as a particle. You know, something completely different happens. It's quantum. You know, these lights are made of small, distinct chunks of light. And what my research looks at is can we merge these two cases where we have very strong light that's also quantum. It has these completely different uh, modes of interaction and bring them together. And this work that we're doing both theory and physically in the lab, we feel is bringing this new, entirely new playground to observe physics in these two extreme regimes, which hopefully uh, will tell us a lot about the world that we live in. Um, so I'd like to thank uh, my parents, my family, my brother over there, uh, my professor, the Adams family. And I see I have two, 10 more seconds. So I'll note that out of two uh, entire you know, generations of Adams here, the only two people that are bachelors are from Edo Kaminer's group. So maybe using this extra scholarship money, we can have you know, our next group outing somewhere with you know, maybe Haifa University, maybe a pickup bar. I don't know. Think about it. You know? <laughs> Thank you very much. Hey, uh, so ever since I was a little girl, I was always curious about the why behind everything. Why do we have only five fingers? Why did God create the light uh, three days after the sun? Is it even possible? So these endless questions often annoyed my parents and many of my teachers as I couldn't let things go without understanding the reason behind them. And thankfully, I found the field where my endless curiosity is actually good things, science. So I know that research interests me, but the problem was that everything was so interesting and I didn't know what to choose. So I found myself in a dual degree in bioengineering and neuroscience running across the uh, university from one faculty to another, to be my classes on time, constantly thinking uh, which direction I want to choose. Uh, during my academic journey, I understand that I actually can combine these two fields, that brain research uh, involves many of uh, engineering applications. So this is why I continued to a direct PhD program in neuroscience, but I conducted my research in the bio and biomedical, biomedical engineering department in Dr. Tali Yelvich lab, um, focused on non-invasive ultrasound technologies. 
So uh, I'll share with you a little bit about my research. Um, so as our brain is one of the most important organs in our brain, we want to protect it from harmful, from harmful substances in the blood. So we have a kind of barrier, like a locked door, that prevents the material from the blood enter to the brain. The problem is that this same locked door, the barrier that protects the brain, also don't let medicine go in when we want to treat various brain diseases, for example, brain cancer. So we already know that we can create in the lab special kind of bubbles called microbubbles that can react to focus ultrasound and open this barrier. Um, as we can focus uh, sun, uh, sunlight to a specific spot with lens, we can focus the ultrasound beam to a specific area. And in this area, the bubbles react to the ultrasound and they open the barrier. And then the drugs can go through. The problem is that this technique don't work good enough in small blood vessels. So in my PhD, I try to enhance this method by using even smaller bubbles called nanobubbles uh, to enhance the, the effect and uh, improve the, the drug delivery to the brain. And I'm so glad that in this research, I found the combination between neuroscience and engineering that I've been looking for. Uh, so thank you very much for listening. I want to thank to the Adams family for this great opportunity and my parents, uh, Rafi and Neely, and my partner, Roy. That came in today and support me along the way. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm deeply honored to be here today. Uh, when I reflect on how to share my academic journey, I realize that it starts long before my university days. You see, my grandfather, who is sitting in this room, is a theoretical physicist and an expert on the history of science. So while other kids grew up idolizing Michael Jordan, Harry Potter, or Superman, my childhood heroes were Einstein, Thomas Edison, and Marie Curie. I remember spending countless hours at the Science Museum, after which I would proudly recite to my elementary school teachers that the fourth dimension is time, even though I didn't fully understand what it meant back then. My parents, who are both biologists, showed me around their labs, when I, where I got my first glimpse of what being a researcher actually means. Growing up, I didn't only learn about science, I was surrounded by it. So it's clear that these early experiences sparked my will to pursue science in my adult life. I initially started physics at the Hebrew University, but eventually got involved in biology, perhaps to catch up with my parents and my wife, but also because of how fascinating and complex life is. My research now focuses on antibiotic treatments. As we all know, antibiotics are extremely powerful, and they have changed the course of history. Modern antibiotics can kill more than 99% of bacteria in an infection. But what about the stubborn remaining 1%? These cells survive and can eventually cause the infection to return. We see a similar pattern in cancer cells treated with chemotherapy. A small percentage of cells can survive and regenerate. This brings us to the key question. Can we predict which cells will survive? In our lab, we've discovered that in some cases, this survival behavior seems random. There's no clear pattern, or more accurately, the data is so complex that we haven't yet identified a predictable biological response. It's like trying to predict which way a coin will end. There is an underlying mechanism, but it's hidden in complexity. And this is where physics comes into play. Just like how we can calculate the average properties of a gas, even though each of the molecules randomly bounces back and forth, we can apply the ideas of statistical physics to model this seemingly disordered behavior. By generating quantitative models, we can gain a deeper understanding of the underlying mechanisms. If we can decode this randomness, we may be able to predict and control it. Imagine if we could tailor antibiotic treatments so precisely that we eliminate every last persistent cell, or if cancer therapies could be fine-tuned so that we target the final resilient cells that allow tumors to grow back. This is the vision driving my research. Before I conclude, I would like to express my gratitude to the Adams Foundation and the Israeli Academy of Sciences for their generous support. 
Thank you for believing in my ideas and for supporting my path to pursue these goals. Hi, good afternoon, thank you. Uh, my name is Vladimir, but you can call me Vova for short. And uh, the first part of my speech may resemble the speech of Yevgeny, but all the before, it's not surprised because the four, first four, year, four years of my life were actually spent together in one school here in Jerusalem. So I came to Israel in 2008 uh, when I was 13 with a program called Nale, Nor Lelif Neorim, or uh, youth comes to Israel uh, before their parents. And um, <clears throat> uh, my parents are still in Ukraine. So the before statement is still uh, relevant for me. So we're in between two wars, uh, as you may understand. Um, but uh, after the school, I uh, I went to a military where I spent three years of my life in the uh, combat uh, Kfir infantry unit, and uh, after which um, uh, in, uh, infantry, and uh, after which I uh, started my bachelor's in the biochemistry and food science in the faculty of uh, agriculture in uh, Rehovot. Uh, after this, I moved to, to my master's uh, in the Weizmann Institute under the guidance of my amazing advisor, Professor Nama Barkai, and uh, where I'm currently doing also my PhD studies. So uh, speaking about my research, each and every one of us here in this room is composed of billions of cells. And uh, each cell in our body acts and uh, looks in a way that it has to. A cell of an eye is a cell of an eye, a cell of a heart is a cell of a heart, and they look and function differently. In the origin, though, each and every one of them look the same. But somehow, each and every one of them, each and every one of them has the potential to become every type of cell. We call this potential a DNA. And moving into the analogies, you can imagine that this DNA, like a big book of recipes, lots of recipes, it contains actually all of them. And some imaginary cook cooks them from time to time. The problem is that the only thing that cooks know is how to cook. He doesn't know when and what recipes to actually use. And one of the key players, one of these imaginary chefs that execute these programs are called transcription factors. So these chefs know precisely when and what recipes, what functions to produce and give to this cook. So what we study in the lab of uh, Professor Nama Barakai is how these transcri transcription factors, the chefs, um, do their function and how they know the precisely when and what uh, recipes to cook. Moving back to, to a family, uh, I am married to Ksenia and I have a small son, uh, Michael. He is uh, two years and two months old. Unfortunately, they couldn't come here tomorrow, but uh, they are my uh, biggest support. and. Uh, from now on, uh, also Adam's family, thank you for supporting me and my PhD journey. And uh, this is it. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, um, so my name is Doron Pinko and I'm from Ben Gurion University of the Negev. But my story actually st starts in the Arava. Um, so I grew up in the Arava desert in a remote place called Kibbutz Nevecharif. 
Um, so how, how remote is it? Uh, the closest city is Alat, which is 40 minutes by car from there, so quite remote. Um, my uh, father works in agriculture and my mother is a science teacher, and thank you for coming all the way from Darama. Um, and um, our house was always full with unique animals and plants. And as a child, I spent most of my days outside, which makes you more aware of climate and also changing seasons. And um, the desert was our natural playground. We were exploring outside, playing, uh, collecting rocks and seed. And um, as my mother is a science teacher, the curiosity about how things work also influenced me. So bringing all of this together, this led to my research today, which is geobiology. So geo is the study of earth and past processes, and bio is the study of living things and current processes. And um, the star of my research that combines these two, biology and geology, is a living being called foraminifera. So foraminifera are these small living organisms that are composed of one cell. This one cell is covered with mineralized shell, similar to seashells we find on the beach. And just like seashells, when the foraminifera die, their mineral shell remain intact and sink to the bottom of the sea. So their shells are preserved in the fossil record. However, foraminifera are unique. This is because they are considered living fossils. This is because we can find the, these um, foraminifera today in the oceans as we can find them like millions of years ago. But foraminifera have another key to their success. Some foraminifera, like corals, have symbiosis with algae. Symbiosis means they live together as partners. So in my study, I study the biology of modern foraminifera. And by doing so, I can also better understand past processes. So to do my research, I regularly collect samples from the Mediterranean and the Red Sea. Um, this actually means that a day in the office for me is sometimes just to go to the beach, which is highly recommended, by the way. Um, and uh, in my research, I specifically explore the interactions between the foraminifera host and their agile partner. And by studying these interactions, um, we can better understand their sensitivity to the ongoing climate change and although also other processes like their sensitivity, um, like their evolution, um, as one of my projects led to the discovery of a new type of agile partnership. Um, finally, um, I hope that my uh, research on foraminifera can influence our understanding of large-scale processes um, like ev evolution and also adaptation to climate change. And I also hope to contribute to future efforts to mitigate the effects of climate change. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much for the journey. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Jonathan. I live in uh, Tel Aviv with my beautiful wife Adi and my baby boy Lavi. Uh, I completed degrees in both computer science and medicine uh, and I applied this interdisciplinary background to cancer research. I want to first take this opportunity to thank my mother, Dr. Nira Adler. Uh, besides being a, lover, a loving mother and recently grandmother, uh, my mom is one of the leading experts in business strategy. My interdisciplinary path is inspired by my mother, who is constantly learning and leading efforts in virtually every important industry. I also want to thank my father, Doron. 10 years ago, my father founded a tech company with the goal of protecting children with special needs children like my younger brother, Itamar, who has autism. My dad applied his experience in technology to a challenge that was close to his heart. I made a similar decision when my brother was diagnosed with cancer. At the time, I had just completed a degree in computer science, and I decided to start medical school to acquire the knowledge required for tackling this devastating disease. 
My research focuses on the following challenge. When a patient is diagnosed with cancer, his life is filled with uncertainty. During therapy, it can take many months until it is clear if the treatment is effective or if the tumor was growing throughout this entire time. There are long periods of total blindness between each test. One of the reasons it is so difficult to predict the effects of treatment is that a tumor is composed of millions of interacting cells. In my research, I make use of high-resolution images of tumors, capturing vivid snapshots of millions of cells. I then analyze these images using machine learning. What is unique about my approach is that I'm not simply correlating images with patient outcomes, but I'm using machine learning to learn the rules that govern the interactions between cells. I use this approach to construct dynamical models that tell us what will happen to the tumor over time and even predict the effects of interventions. Hopefully this approach will shed some light on these long periods of blindness during therapy. Thank you everyone, thank you to my beautiful wife, thank you to my advisors, Professor Shaiman Noor and Professor Uri Alon, and, and thank you, Sylvan. Uh, I wanted to say that your father seems like a, a remarkable person and his personal story, I think, gave important historical context to this event. Right, so that's the, the worst spot, right? Right after someone who's beating cancer, so uh, I'll try to do my best. So, uh, hi everyone, I'm Elad and I, um, I'm studying math and computer science. And actually, math has been my thing since I was a little kid. So picture this, I'm four years old and I'm standing outside my older sister's room while she and my mom tackle her math homework. And I'm quietly eavesdropping, I'm trying to, to hear the question. And once I, I crack it, I just shout out the answer. So uh, even back then I was quite excited about math, but I'm sure my sister did not appreciate my excitement quite as much. Um, so after that, during high school, instead of joining the scouts, I joined something quite different. I studied for a degree in computer science at the University of Haifa. Um, so that's actually where I met my wonderful uh, uh, wife, Shia, uh, which is here, thank you. Um, so afterwards, I went to the army, and even then in the army, I used to pick a few math problems each morning, think about doing the, the day to spice it up, so uh, it's quite nice. And then after completing the military service, it was quite clear to me I would like to get a master's degree, and that's how I arrived at the Weizmann Institute. I'm currently doing my PhD under the guidance of the legendary professor Itai Binyamini. Um, yeah, so my research uh, is about math and computer science. So I'm trying to understand and study mathematical structures and use them to solve problems in computer science. So one line of work I recently worked on relates to computer networks. So we all have digital phones right in our pockets. Maybe we take pictures right now or just text. And we have routers in our homes, and we use them daily to communicate with each other. And one of the things that this network says is that they are composed of many components which are prone to failure. So sometimes they do not work. Right? So think of a Zoom call. It can be interrupted by a failure of your router at home. It can be interrupted by the failure of a Zoom server or just a cyber attack on a telecommunication provider. So one main goal in this area is to sparsify, to simplify a network, to make it shorter, trim down the number of routers or communication lines the network has without compromising on performance, staying really connected but removing some of the non-essential components. And in a recent work, my collaborators and I dug into this problem. And we actually find out that sophisticated mathematical tools that are seemingly unrelated can be used to solve this task. So more specifically, we found out that certain high dimensional structures can be used to quantify network connectivity. Um, looking ahead, I'm 
uh, uh, looking forward to keep exploring this connection between math and computer science. And on this occasion, I would like to thank the Adams family and the Academy. It's really a great honor. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Elad Zahavi, I'm 31 years old, uh, currently living in Givat Shmuel with my uh, beautiful uh, uh, wife Roni, who sits here, and uh, our uh, baby girl daughter uh, Shoam, who is one, one years old. Um, I think I've always been a person of numbers, and I'll always love, like the previous Elad, math, and also physics. Um, and it, I think I really like precision and order in life. It's not that uh, I have a problem to throw my shoes in the living room at the end of the day, but I do have a precise order for the dishes in the dryer and the routine for dressing my daughter in the morning. Um, this is why I think it's not surprising I picked to engage research in the field of uh, measurement and precision. You might not think about it often, but uh, precise measurements are a critical part of our everyday life. Uh, whether it ensures that all the physical components in your smartphone fit together perfectly or that medical equipment uh, operates accurately, precise me measurements are essential. Now, the most, one of the most powerful tools for achieving such precision is optics, the science of light. Uh, for example, if you're driving your car down the road and suddenly, God forbid, and you see a cop in front of you who aims a laser gun to measure your speed, or uh, if you remember during COVID time when you entered the mall and someone measured your temperature using a thermal, uh, um, laser thermometer, um, optical metrology, which uses light uh, to detect uh, uh, different physical properties, has led to incredible advancements. It's used in everything from developing cutting edge technologies uh, to understanding the fundamental laws of physics. Um, now, to get the most precise measurement, we need to push the boundaries of sensitivity as far as possible. The challenge here is that the, um, the limitation on our measurement sensitivity is the laser light we use, uh, but there are unique states of light beyond what laser can produce, which offer even a higher sensitivity. The challenge here is that uh, uh, the methods for generating and using these unique states of light require uh, uh, usually uh, very complex and expensive setups. Now this is where, where my uh, research comes in. Uh, in our group, we're trying to build what we like to call every man's highly sensitive sensor. The idea is to develop an experimental setup which allows us to measure with higher sensitivity than usual laser light, but without the need for complex and expensive components. Instead, we want to use uh, affordable, common components, some of the shape of the optical fibers you might have uh, heard of in the context of your internet at home, um, inside a simple measurement setup. With that way, we will be able not only to take the sensitive measurement, but also to scale it uh, to a wide range of applications. Um, so these were a few words about my, uh, my research. Uh, in this opportunity, I want to thank uh, Adam's family, and uh, the Israel Academy for Science and uh, Humanities for selecting me for this uh, fellowship. And thank you for listening. And just a few words of welcome. Um, honestly, th this year in particular, it's a real um, it's a real pleasure to be here. The, the, the year we've been through, including the last insane couple of weeks, um, it's really just a pleasure to welcome you. Uh, last year's recipients, unfortunately, we couldn't meet last year, and this year's. And um, I mean, you are the best and the brightest. When my father created this prize, 
actually with my husband who couldn't be here. He's an academic, he's a professor himself, he's been in academia all his life. Um, and when they created the prize, it was really to celebrate the best and the brightest, to help people who have the talent, such as yourselves, um, get to the next level, get to encourage you to discover, to, to be curious, to, um, to, to build good me methodology, to think outside the box, and to bring this country and through this country, the world, to a, to a better place, to a new place. And uh, if my father was here, he would be saying very much, his whole identity was around, um, you know, Agjamad Smit, uh, his own his own uh, path. He 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 did things his own way. He he was very much an autodidact. He himself didn't have the benefit of higher education or very much education at all, and uh, formal education. Uh, but he so celebrated academia and excellence. And I really want to welcome you to this family of prize winners, and to Pashut Alu v'Tatslichu ve. Ve Amisal Chai.